Okay, so we left off kind of working through a confidence interval example in Excel last class. So I wanted to look at this other Excel file called CI grade data. Um, this is, if we're thinking about, so after today's class, uh, I'll get up to the next Excel homework. It's going to be not due for a little bit more than two weeks. So not uh, basically like two weeks from Friday. So even though I'll post it today, you'll have like two weeks in a day to work on it. We'll have covered a decent majority of it, although some of it we're still going to have to see in Excel next week. But this is not the file that I would use as a template. The one for the homework that should be a template is that confidence interval example that we are working out kind of stuff that we did in class here. I'll pull up this as this is our sections. You know, we did some of this work here, but there's a lot more stuff going on. So this will be kind of the template file, the confidence interval example. But this one I wanted to try to use to kind of maybe support the, some of the ideas that we've been talking about. So before we dive too deep into it, I want to do kind of a refresher of what we're doing with these confidence intervals. Switch to the dot cam here real quick. All right, so. One thing that we had set up was if I'm thinking about the distribution of my sample means, as long as I had a sample size over 30, it was normally distributed and it should be distributed around whatever that true population mean is. So we then said, okay, look, I know that if I go 1.96 standard deviations below this population mean, and 1.96 standard deviations above. Well, if I'm 1.96 standard deviations below and above, that's essentially a Z score of 1.96 and negative 1.96. If I looked it up in the table, I would find the area in between those two values is 0.95, or kind of think about the areas out here, right, would be 0 0.05. So we then said, okay, every single, so this is like, you know, the probability that if I took one sample, that I see a sample mean somewhere within 1.96 standard deviations above and below, that probability is 0.95. So if I see a sample mean anywhere in this range, let's say maybe right here, well notice that's not 1.96 standard deviations away. In fact, it's quite a bit less, maybe only like one standard deviation away. So then when I build my confidence interval around that sample mean, and I add, oops, sorry, this would be I subtract to get the lower bound. And then I add 1.96 standard deviations to the sample mean to get my upper bound. Well, notice I was like not even, you know, not even close to 1.96. Maybe I was like one standard deviation away or one standard deviation above. So then when I go 1.96 standard deviations below, I know that I'll kind of like go back past that population mean. And that's going to be true for any sample mean in this range because every single sample mean in this range is less than 1.96 standard deviations away. So when I build that upper and lower bound, I know that it's then going to cross back over that population mean. Now, when I get a sample mean that's somewhere out here, well, now this is more than 1.96 standard deviations away from that mean. So when I build my upper bound here, I went out like, I don't know, two and a half standard deviations and then back 1.96, well then that upper bound isn't gonna be quite back to that population mean and I'll have a confidence interval that doesn't include the true population mean. So if I were able to, and could I just say like, like an infinite number of samples and calculate a sample mean, build a confidence interval, find another sample mean, build a confidence interval, another one, 95% of the time, I'm gonna have a sample mean that has a confidence interval that includes the true population mean. This is going to be fun. All right. Uh, and then 5% of the time, right, I'm going to see a sample mean out here, and I'm going to have a confidence interval that doesn't include the population mean. So, you know, that's if I could take an infinite number. Well, I can't take an infinite number, but I can take a really high number. So that's what I did here. So I started out with this population data. So this is every kind of every grade. No, you're good. Let's see if we can get this switch back over here quick. There we go. So this is every grade they've had. I didn't include last fall, but prior to that, every kind of business stat student I had. So 431. This is just like, you can think about this as like a student ID, right? Just a number to hold the place. 
And these are the different kind of scores that those, those people got. So I know the population mean, right? That's pretty easy to find because I can just take the mean of this population data. Right? I'll explain why these numbers keep changing here in a second. I can also find kind of my population size by using that count function. And I can find my population variance pretty easy. Okay? So what I'm then gonna do is this is where I'm going to show you some stuff in this file that I won't expect you to do on like a homework or anything, but I, it also kind of helps illustrate the power of Excel. So what I did here is I used some random number generator and then I use this thing called VLOOKUP in Excel. We don't have to understand how to use it for the sake of this class, but what this essentially did is it generated a random number, say 47. It then went down to the 47th person, grabbed their grade, and kind of put their grade in. Right? Now this is, I just kind of had a random number here to show you that, you know, that, that it's creating random, that this, uh, this creates random numbers. So it's doing that, it's kind of say, the random number is nine, it goes to that person's test score and puts it in. Actually the good one here would be, let's say the, the random number is 10, goes to the 10th person, grabs their score, and they're the first observation of my sample. I then did that for every single you know, observation here down to this one where now I've got essentially 50 random, right? I randomly selected 50 students and I have their test scores or their grade in the class. Using those scores, I then found my sample mean, right? Of those 50 random grades, I can find the sample mean. I then, last class, we said we can do all this in one cell. So if we just go back to how we built these lower and upper bounds, I use that norm.s.inv to find the z-score that gave me alpha over two in each tail. I multiplied that by, and this equation here represented the standard deviation of my sample means. And then here, well, that's just the cell above, that's where I calculated my sample mean. So when I subtracted my margin of error, it gave me my lower bound. When I added it, that gave me my upper bound. Right? So I've essentially created confidence intervals based off of all these different sample means. Notice, here I can think of this as sample one, sample two, three, so on and so forth, right? And what I actually did was I created, go all the way over, right? I'm way out here, right? I have a thousand different samples and they're all different ra uh, random number generators. So I've got a thousand different samples. They're all of size 50. And I'm gonna set the alpha to make a little more sense as we start out at point one, okay? So I've built all these confidence intervals at the 90% level. It's referencing that alpha value of 0.1. Okay. The next thing I did is, and I showed you a little bit of how to use it, but I used an if statement. And here, this is where I wouldn't expect you to do this either. This is kind of a nested if statement. This is what, you know, kind of pushing it further than what I, I want for this class. But all, what you need to know is what I have in this cell is basically just saying, okay, look, look at the lower and upper bound is the population mean within that range. Okay. So sure enough, it's within just within this range, right? Just above the lower bound. So I put a one there. Is it within this range? Well, the population mean was like almost 70, I think it was 79.8. So yep, it's in that range, put a one. The only time there's not a one there, let's see, where's the first, right? So here I had an abnormally high sample mean. Compare, I mean, compared to what the true population mean is. And now I usually can't see the population mean, but in this case I can. So when I built this confidence interval, notice 79.8 or whatever is just outside of it, okay? So this confidence interval doesn't include the true population mean, so I put a zero in here. So what this row does is essentially has a one if the confidence interval included the population mean and a zero if not. Now, what if, I'm, what, if what I'm telling you is true, if I build confidence intervals with an alpha of 0.1, I should be right 90% of the time and wrong 10% of the time. Out of a thousand samples, that would mean I have 900 samples that included the true population mean when I built the confidence interval and a hundred of them where I didn't, right? So what I then did is, okay, I'm just gonna add up these, this row. So every time there's a one, that means it was in the interval. Every time there's a zero, there's not. So when I add those up, it'll basically tell me the number of confidence intervals I had that included that true population mean. Okay. Sure enough, it's just below 900, right? And if I do kind of out of those 1,000, put it in percentage form, I've got about, you know, just under 90% of my confidence intervals 
included that true population mean. Now, every time I click on a cell and hit enter, it's generating new random numbers. So I'm getting like completely different random samples. So notice this floats around a little bit. It's a little bit higher than 90 sometimes. If I can get this changed almost exactly 90. Sometimes it'll go, if I can get the right random numbers, sometimes it'll go just below 90, right? But it's always gonna be right around that 90%. Now, why isn't it exactly 90% to match my alpha? Well, I only have a thousand samples, right? Um, I would you know, need kind of an infinite number. I don't have an infinite, but this is, you know, shows pretty, pretty close to, to what we would see if we had an infinite number of samples, right? Really close to that, that kind of 90% of my confidence intervals, including that population mean. And the way I have it set up, you know, if we change the alpha to 0 0.01, now we should see about 99% of the confidence intervals, including that true population mean. And sure enough, really close, pretty close, really close, right? Floating right around that 99% value. So I don't know, I think this is kind of going back to that discussion about thinking about exactly what we're doing with confidence intervals, kind of proving that to you with some data. Now, the one issue is this is great and I can like show you this thought experiment, but we usually don't have, we aren't usually seeing this population data, right? Usually we just see one of these samples, right? And so that's why, you know, usually all we have to go off is, is just this, right? The lower and upper bound. But here I could kind of, kind of cheat a little bit since I had the population data. So I just think that's a good way of, of kind of reiterating what we're doing with confidence intervals. But where am I? Nope, we wanna go back here. And we're gonna start with the population proportion in the slides, okay? So if we go back and think about, you know, we said that we know that sample means we normally distribute it if we have a sample size over 30. We also know that that sample proportion will be normally distributed if we have a sample size over 30. What will it be distributed around? Well, now not the true population mean, but around the true population proportion. And what was the variance or the standard deviation of the sample portions? Well, that was just the variance of the original data we sampled from, which was P times one minus P divided by my sample size. If I want the standard deviation, I took the square root. Well, now the problem is if we're gonna to start to try to build confidence intervals for uh, where the true population proportion is, all we see is a sample proportion. Well, if I am trying to build a confidence interval for what it is, I, I, you know, I don't have information on what that is. I don't have information on the, what the population proportion is. So what we're gonna to have to do is use a, our best estimate that we can, which is to use the sample proportion instead to um, compute what the standard deviation of our sample proportions is. So just to kind of revisit sample proportions and relate it to what we've been talking about, you know, before we had sample means distributed normally around the true population mean, and the standard deviation of our sample means was the square root of the original population variance from the data we sampled from over my sample size. With our sample proportions, what we have is they're gonna be normally distributed around whatever that true population proportion is. And the standard deviation of our sample proportions, well, it should be square root of the variance of what we sampled from should be P times one minus P over our sample size. The only issue was, well, if we're trying to build a confidence interval, we don't know the population proportion. The best estimate we have is kind of using the sample proportion that we see. Well, now from here, before to do confidence intervals, we were using this equation, right? And we said, if we wanted to, we don't have to calculate the intermediate value here. We could plug this right into here. But with our sample proportions, it's the same thing, but well, now I'm building my confidence interval, not around a sample mean, but around a sample proportion. I can still, I still know that they're normally distributed, so I can still use, you know, look up the number of standard deviations I wanna go above and below to create my lower and upper bound. And now I, you know, how many standard deviations away do I go? Well, the standard deviation I'm looking at is the standard deviation of my sample proportions. So another way we could write this, right? Once again, instead of calculating the intermediate step here, I could just think of this as, right? 
plug that equation right in. These are really the same thing. Just with this one, I'd have to calculate that intermediate, intermediate value of what that standard deviation is. So it's really the same sort of setup. It just looks a little different because before we were given this known population variance and now the population variance of a, of a sample mean is gonna be right here. Sorry, sample mean. The population variance of a, of a proportion is gonna be right here. And we had to use, you know, truly it should be just the population proportion, but we don't have that. So we use the best estimate that we have, which is the sample proportion. Okay. But other than that, the steps are really gonna be the same. Any questions on, on any of that, revisiting that discussion? Okay. So with that in mind, um, this is where I, I think I, I hopefully I mentioned it. I said that I was going to be referring to what we were adding and subtracting to our sample statistic as the margin of error. Technically that term is, is really only supposed to be used for proportions, but it makes it easier to talk about so that we've been calling it that already, right? So we've got this margin of error here that we're adding and subtracting to our sample proportion to get our lower and upper bound. So let's think of an example. I right? put, some, put some numbers to this. So uh, what? We had a 2012 poll about uh, the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare and found 63 out of 81 respondents favor the requirement that insurance companies cover people with pre-existing conditions. Find a 99% confidence interval for the true population proportion of people that favor that. Okay. So let's just set this up. What are we doing? I'm gonna waste my piece of paper. I think my black marker's dying, so I'm gonna use a blue one here. Um, we've got, first of all, what's our sample proportion? Okay. Well, we were told that, and I already forgot, I think it's 63 out of 81. Mm -hmm. Is it? Okay. So 63 out of 81, so our sample proportion is 63 over 81, right? Or I think this simplifies to seven ninths. So I've got my sample proportion, my sample size, well, that's just 81. And then I wanted to build the 99% confidence interval. So the 99% confidence interval, my alpha is, yep, the area outside my confidence interval is 1% in decimal form, 0.01. So when we're building confidence intervals, the first thing we need to do is identify the z-score that gives us yep, 0 0.005, right, or alpha over two in each tail, okay? So 0 0.005 in each tail. So we go to the table. Point zero zero five uh, looks like it's in between these two values here. So negative two point five, or sorry, negative two point five seven and negative two point five eight. Right. So we'll use the higher and absolute value of the two. So negative two point five eight. Now notice when I say negative two point five eight, that's because I looked up alpha over two. I was looking at the area in the left tail, but my confidence interval equation, right, has that negative and positive kind of already built into it. So really I'm just plugging in 2.58 here. Okay. And then multiply this, right, we got the rest of the equation. So I now have everything I need, right? I've got my sample proportion, I can plug that in. Sample size, I looked at the z-score. Actually there's fewer components in this equation, then we're looking at sample means, so I'm, I'm got everything plugged in already. Now I could have done the intermediate step where I calculate, right, the standard deviation of my sample proportions first, right? So I don't know what this ends up being. I think I have it in the slides, but we'll take a look in a second. Thank you. <laughs> right, so I plug that in, plug in my sample size. I can get this and then I would, you know, do the intermediate step there. So it's really similar to what we were doing before. Right? Kind of the key is, if you're not directly given the sample proportion, if it's this many out of this many, well, that's how you calculate your proportion, right? 63 out of 81. And then kind of the same procedure of looking up that z-score that gives you alpha over two in each tail. And then at that point, it's just a matter of kind of plugging and chugging, right? Like kind of getting things entered into our calculator correctly. So 
Um, oh, I put these benchmark values up here because hopefully we've started noticing, we're gonna start seeing a lot of these values pretty commonly. So 1.96 always kind of gave us that area in the interval of 0.95, 1.65 gives 0.9 in the middle. And then kind of you can, can imagine, whoop, I got a typo there, that should be 2.58, right? You can change that right now. While I'm thinking about it, all right, 2.58. So these are just kind of some, some values that'll pop up a lot because they have these kind of nice benchmark values. So we already kind of talked through this, right? We had everything we needed. We looked at the Z-score. We could calculate this intermediate value. Ends up being about 0 0.046. And that's just a matter of plugging everything in. Okay? So we get, you know, with 99% confidence, I could say that the you know, percent of the proportion of people that are in support of the Affordable Care Act was between about, what, two-thirds and almost 90%. So, you know, although maybe it, <laughs> If someone painted this picture in 2012 that people weren't very much in support of this, you could look at this survey and say, well, 99% comps, I can tell you that like the true population portion of people in favor of this is over two thirds, like two thirds of people, which is pretty good for any policy. Usually we're pretty split 50-50. So the fact that 50% isn't in this interval kind of bodes well for that policy. Right? Um, any questions on, on that before we keep Keep moving along here. This is kind of our work that we did by hand. I guess I have a lot of this stuff in, in the, the slides, but I always like to kind of show you, I don't know, seeing it worked out by hand and this is how you're gonna do it, is, you know, makes a little bit more sense. So, all right, not seeing anything pop up, okay. So I think I did this one. Um, so this example is starting to get a little bit, bit dated. I could have uh, maybe updated this for, um, the last election, but there was a, this was an actual survey. I didn't just make these numbers up. That's probably why I didn't. I probably couldn't find a, a survey that had the a sample size this large. So I had this sample of uh, 912 registered voters in the US and 46% said they were gonna vote for Clinton. So this was in the, uh, what, 2016 election. So if I wanted to build a 90% confidence interval for the true proportion of people who are gonna vote for Clinton were, uh, was, how would I do that? Well, I've got my sample proportion, it's gonna be 0.46. Got my sample size of 912, and I want a 90% confidence interval. So, let's set this up pretty similar to how we did before. Well, yeah, so, you know, this is gonna be one of the hard things, right, with some of these word problems or just how we actually do this in practice. That could be phrased very differently. Like, I don't know what the number is off the top of my head, but it's, it would be something like what? 400 out of 912 people said they were gonna vote for it. And so, okay, then I have to calculate the sample proportion, 400 divided by 912. Or maybe they just straight up give it to me. You know, it's a sample portion of 0.46, the proportion of people who wanted to vote for it. Or it could state the percent of people who wanted to vote. And right there, I know it's my proportion is really just a percentage in decimal form. Yeah, so those are kind of like the three different ways you, you would have to identify that sample proportion, which here we did as 0.46. Yep, it's a good question though. Um, sample size is 912. And then we wanted the 90% confidence level. So my alpha would be, yeah, 10% outside the interval in decimal form, 0.1. So the Z-score that we want to be thinking about is this z-score that gives me a 0.9 in the middle or alpha in the tails. So half of alpha would be in each tail. So 0.1 over two, I wanna look up the area in the tail of 0.05. Okay. So I go to my table, 0 0.05. This should be a value that we see pop up a lot. Okay, it's in between these two. So negative 1.64 and negative 1.65. I'll use the higher of the two. So I think about this as positive and negative 1.65 here is a z-score I need. Now we said those signs are already built into our confidence interval equation. And here, I'm gonna actually not do the intermediate step. Now it's just a matter of plugging everything in, right? I've got 0.46. If 
I add 1.65 times 0.46 times 1 minus 0.46 over 912. Right? And then I'll do the same thing to get my lower bound, right? But I'll subtract, whoops, sorry, that margin of error. So this is my upper bound, this is my lower bound. So hopefully when I'm building these confidence intervals, right, I should be getting values that are between zero and one because I'm looking at a proportion. Another issue um, we could think about here is what's going to be true about this confidence rule? Is it going to be pretty wide or pretty, pretty narrow? Well, I'm not saying it with the highest level of confidence, right? I'm only at 90%. So we know that when I want to say things with large levels of confidence, that widens my interval. So that shouldn't widen it too much. But think about my sample size here. My sample size was 912. With a denominator that large, what's going to happen to my standard deviation, right? Remember this guy right here represented the standard deviation of my sample proportions. With a sample size of 912, that standard deviation is going to be pretty, the denominator goes up, this fraction actually goes down. Yeah. All right, so higher sample size here. It's going to mean that my standard deviation is pretty small. So when I go 1.65 standard deviations to the right and to the left, well, 1.65 might seem like a lot, but my standard deviation is going to be like 0.000. I don't know. I don't know. So I'll show you in a second. It's going to be pretty small, right, with a sample size that uh, large. So sure enough, I go to oh, I put my benchmark values up there again. So I found that z-score. If I calculate the intermediate step. 0, I guess it's not as small as I maybe initially thought, but 0 0.0165, that's pretty small, right? So I then add and subtract to that uh, margin of error to my sample portion at my lower and upper bound, and I get, what, 0.43 and 0.487, okay? So I'm just going to write this down for a second so I don't forget these. So 0.4328 and 0.4872. So I could think about, before I move to the next example, I could think about, here's my lower bound, here's my upper bound. This is the range of values that with 90% confidence, I can tell you that the true population proportion of people who are gonna vote for Clinton is somewhere in this range. Now, if I'm trying to predict an election, I look at this upper bound and I think, well, that's not great because it's not 50% yet, right? But we know that there's third party candidates, so, you know, that might not be the worst thing in the world, right? If it's somewhere in this range. But we can think about, and I, I, the, the politics is a, is a good example to, to highlight this. I'm gonna to start to point out another use of confidence intervals, right? So I've got the 90% confidence, confidence interval for, for Clinton. I could do the exact same thing, but do it for Trump, right? So this same poll had the same 912 people found, oh, sorry. My mouse is spasming. So the same poll found that 40% of people were planning to vote for Trump. So if I build a confidence interval around that, I end up with these values. So it's the exact same process. We're just going to have different numbers, right? So I've got 0.37 and 0.4267. Okay. So what I'm going to do here, let me see. Actually make this easier on me so I can see the numbers. All right, so we had, let me give myself a little more room. 0.433, or sorry, 28, 0.4872, right? That was for Clinton. And then the upper bound for Trump was what? Yep, 0.4267 and 0.3732, right? So going into that election, I could have looked at this and, and, and you know, graphed out these two confidence intervals, which I'll now make a little bit bigger so we can see them. So I graph out these two confidence intervals and I say, well, look, I mean, with 90% confidence, the true proportion of people who are gonna vote for Trump is, you know, somewhere in this range. And the true proportion of uh, people who want to vote for Clinton, right, is somewhere in this range, right, somewhere in here. Well, there's no values 
such that the population portion of people who are going to vote for Trump is going to be greater than that for Clinton, because these two confidence intervals don't overlap. Right? So based off of these confidence intervals, I could say, you know, with 90% confidence that the popular vote was going to go to Clinton. And sure enough, it did. Right. And I think actually the, the interesting thing about that poll was, I remember when I went out and got it, I got it from Fox News. So this was like the most bias that we could get to try to predict the election. Right. Now, I could say it with 90% confidence, but if I wanted to go to 99, right, that's going to mean if I want 99% confidence, alpha over two is going to be smaller. So to get less area in the tail, I need a larger Z value. If the Z value goes up, I'm adding and subtracting a larger, I have a larger margin of error, I'm going to get a wider interval. So I think if you, if you work out these numbers, what ends up being true is at the 99% level, and I'll use red for Trump here and, and blue for Clinton. What ends up being true at the 99% level is that lower bound and that upper bound kind of push out enough to now that these confidence intervals overlap. Now, if we have confidence intervals that overlap, I mean, I don't want to say it's, it's not like a bad thing. It's just that I can't make a lot of statements. If this is the 99% level, you know, the true proportion of people who are going to vote for Trump could be here. The true population proportion of people who are going to vote for Clinton could be here. Or it could be that the true proportion of people who are going to vote for Clinton is right here. The proportion of people who are going to vote for Trump is down here. So I don't know which one's larger, or at least I can't make a statement about which one is going to be larger with 99% confidence. So, you know, this is like another use of, of confidence intervals. We can start to compare two different confidence intervals. And if they don't overlap, well, then with that level of 90% confidence, I could say, okay, this, this population portion is going to be higher. If they do overlap, I can't say that, right? Because I don't know exactly where the, the true population portion is, you know, and it could be that they're here or here. And so, so another, another kind of use of, of confidence intervals there that we really haven't kind of looked at up to this point. Right? So you can, Kind of plug all the, those, oops, sorry, plug all those values in. I think I then updated this um, prior to the last election pretty quickly. And it's, uh, you know, if you want to take a look at it, there's some additional examples. It's really the exact same setup. Uh, I found a large survey. This one wasn't from Fox. I forget. This one was from some, was it Reuters? Or so, so one of those companies that kind of tries to, to predict, predict elections. So you could build a confidence interval there. It was quite a bit bigger gap. In, the, in this last election. So it wasn't as, as interesting because even at the 99% level here, we're not going to get that lower and upper bound across. Um, so, you know, I had the numbers in here just to kind of be, be interesting. So we, you know, you could maybe have made the prediction of the 2020 election um, based off of this survey, right? It, we kind of could have could have guessed where the, those population proportions were and there was never going to be any overlap in those confidence intervals. Uh, what does I have here? Oh, I use a different poll. I think I, I was trying to really, really trying to get a prediction. So I think in this one, I actually did find one, right? That had a little bit higher percent for Trump and, and a little bit lower for Biden. And there, if we look at the lower bound for Biden, it was just below the upper bound for Trump. So there was still at the 90% level, still some possibility that we, we saw the popular vote go that way, at least in our prediction of it. But, you know, if you notice, that overlap was pretty small. And so even if there is an overlap, if it's a really small overlap, the chances are that you're not going to see that, right? So um, no, there's some interesting examples to think about how we can start using these confidence intervals. And making predictions in, of elections is actually one that's very plausible. In fact, if you look at some of the polling data that they do, they'll usually report to you what this margin of error is. So like they'll say, uh, you know, recent survey found that 47% of people are gonna vote for, for Donald Trump in the upcoming election with a, with a uh, or plus or minus three, or plus or minus 3.2. And they usually round it to an integer. But what they're really giving you there is they're giving you that margin of error. So when you look at those reports, you could actually, if I know the margin of error and I know the, the proportion, I could build confidence intervals off what they're saying more often than not. Um, so uh, kind of kind of interesting kind of application there that we might might have seen before. Okay. Are we out of time? Okay. Any questions on that up to this point? 
and like I said, I'm not, I didn't work through these by hand. I just kind of had them so we could have some additional, uh, see some additional applications. Oh, that's not what I wanted to do. What I wanted to do, there we go, is go back to this confidence intervals example uh, file. So we worked on it a little bit last class, but if I can do confidence intervals for sample means in Excel, very likely can do confidence intervals for sample proportions in Excel. So I'm going to get rid of this, right, down here, just delete it. I'm going to come back up here and, okay, I have a sample proportion of sample size. How did I calculate that? Well, here's that data set where we have undergraduate enrollment. I created this additional variable, which was, does this school have more than 10,000 students? One if they do, zero if they don't. So to get a sample proportion, we said it's actually just a very unique case of the mean. So I'm just going to use that mean formula in Excel, right, that average formula. And what it's going to do is it's going to find the mean of this one zero variable. So essentially, it's going to count up the number of schools that have over 10,000 students and then divide it by just the total number of observations I have here, which is essentially what we're doing to calculate our sample portion, right? 63 out of 81. Here it would be, I don't know, maybe 63 out of 111. Right? So I find that sample proportion by simply using that average formula, right? It's just the mean of a one zero variable. Found my sample size, use the count formula, right? Just counts the number of observations I have. So remember our sample size is kind of N here. So the next step, if we're doing this by hand and in Excel, what we're gonna do is we can find these Z values, right? How do we do that? We said, well, I know the area that I want in the tail is always going to be alpha over two. So norm.s.inv, right, I'm starting out with the area in the tail or the probability of being below a certain Z value. And I want Excel to spit back out of me what that Z value is, right? So the area I want in that lower left tail is alpha over two, right? But just like when we were doing this by hand, we said, well, if I look up alpha over two, I'm going to be looking up a small area. I'm always going to get a negative Z value. And when I look at my upper and lower bound, that sign's already built into those formulas. So I can just take the absolute value, right? That ABS function, it'll just drop the, you know, the negative sign. Now I get that same Z value, but positive. And if I drag this down, it updates that cell reference to use this new alpha. I'm going to be able to build three confidence intervals pretty quickly at the 90, 95 and 99% confidence levels. So this is, you know, we did this last class. This is something that we've already done. Um, but what about calculating the lower and upper bound for a sample proportion? Well, let me see if I can, where is that guy? Here it is. We have this formula for our confidence interval for a sample portion where this square root of that, all, you know, all this jazz represented the standard deviation of our sample portion. So we can calculate the intermediate value first, right? So up here I can think about, I can find the standard deviation of my sample proportions. And that's just the square root, right? SQRT, so the square root of my sample proportion times one minus my sample proportion divided by my sample size, which is in cell Q2 there. I could have selected it, but I, I still need to figure out why this box gets so large. I can probably preset it. But now I've got that formula entered in there to calculate that standard deviation of my sample proportions. Now from there, it's just take my sample proportion, add, whatever that Z score is that gives me alpha over two times that standard deviation of my sample proportion. Right? So now it should be pretty easy for my lower bound. I'll take my sample proportion. I'll then subtract the number of standard deviations away I wanna go or that Z value that gives me alpha over two. And if this is the number of standard deviations away I wanna go, well, what's the standard deviation? All right, right there. So take that Z value, multiply it by the standard deviation. So that should give me my lower bound. Now, if I try to copy this down to, for my next two confidence intervals, I want that Z value to update, but I don't want these cells to. 
I want to keep using the same sample mean and standard deviation of my sample proportions. So I'm just going to go put dollar signs in front of those, those references. Now, when I copy this down, I get my three lower bounds. Okay. Now, the way to do the upper bound is probably easiest is double click on that cell so you see the formula, copy it, hit enter to get out of the cell, click on that upper bound and then paste it there. You know the only difference in the lower and upper bound is that we add instead of subtract that margin of error. Now I can copy this down. And just like with sample means, I can build confidence intervals for my sample portion pretty quickly at a lot of different alpha values. Here I just did three, but you can imagine I could have done as many as I wanted and I'm just dragging, I'm just copying those cells down to, to do this. So, you know, one thing that's kind of nice that proves this to us, you know, if I'm thinking about confidence level, and I think I did this last class, but I'm just really trying to, oh, that's not what I wanted to do. I'm just trying to reiterate things. Um, really just want things to, to kind of sink in here. So here's my confidence levels that correspond to these alphas. Notice if I want to say something with a higher level of confidence, we said intuitively I need to then have a wider range of values. So here with a higher level of confidence, we can see that, oh yeah, my intervals are getting wider because the lower bound's getting lower and the upper bound's getting higher, right? So I'm getting this wider confidence interval when I want to say things with a higher level of confidence. Any questions on that? You said you froze the oh, standard yep. deviation of sample proportion. Uh, I, yep, we froze that sample proportion or that mean proportion and we uh, froze the standard deviation of my sample proportions. Yep. Oh, okay. Yep. Now, these are pretty wide ranges. I mean, if we really think about it, what's. <laughs> Theoretically, what's the largest confidence interval I could ever see for sample proportions? Well, I'm dealing with the proportion, so it has to be between zero and one. So the widest interval I could ever see would have a length of one. Yeah. So here, I mean, I've got a length of what, 0.13-ish. It's pretty big in the grand scheme of things. Uh, uh, scheme of things. So what's something that could kind of decrease that width? But one thing we said that we, we sometimes can do is get a larger sample size, right? So that, that larger sample size, right, we think about here, that sample size, if it increases, well, then this fraction is going to decrease. So I'm adding and subtracting something that's a smaller value. So I'm going to get a narrower confidence interval. Now, we can see this play out in Excel. This is kind of cheating because I don't actually have you know, or sorry, what I actually have is 111. But let's just say, you know, I don't know, let's say I had 500 schools, right, instead. So instead of having that interval of 0.13, when I hit enter here, I'll update my values, kind of closed it a little bit, right? It's a little bit, a little bit tighter here. Now it's about what, 0 0.06. So I kind of cut it in half, right? Um, you know, which, re, you know, really highlights that when I had surveys uh, of those political polls that were like 1500, Notice if I had 1,500, this starts to get a lot, lot more narrow, right? So, you know, that's something that we usually can somewhat change. You know, in this example, I couldn't, but if I'm just giving out surveys, I can, I can go randomly hand out more surveys. So let me send this back though so that we have the, the count function there. It's what they actually should be. Any questions over under any of that in Excel? A lot of this is like, like I said, it's pretty much exactly what we did last class, but a little bit of a difference when we calculated that standard deviation of our sample means, a little bit difference in that formula. Okay. All right, let me make sure there's nothing in the chat here. Okay. Uh, hmm. Let me save this because I'll post this after class. The next thing that we're gonna start talking about, so we've got what, 30 minutes? I don't think I put this up on Canvas because I didn't think we wasn't sure if we'd quite get this far. So I I'll introduce the idea today. I don't think we'll work through a ton of examples since I don't I don't have the tables up there. Um, but here we go. All right, so we'll go back to the slide. So 
At this point, we've looked at how to do, to do the examples by hand in Excel for sample means and sample proportions. Now, the sample mean one seems a little goofy, right? So with the sample portion, I said, when we were calculating that standard deviation, I didn't have the population portion, so I had to estimate it by using my sample portion. Well, if I'm trying to build a confidence interval for the, where the true population mean is, how, how do I know the population variance but not the population mean, right? Like, how, how did that happen? Well, usually it's because I know that there's a production process and, you know, I know the variance of the machinery or something, but more often than not, we're not going to know that population variance. So what do we do if that's the case, right? We don't have a population variance. Well, do we estimate it with a sample variance? Short answer is yes, long, but there's a lot more to it, right? So most of the time, um, we're not going to know that population standard deviation. So what can I do? I basically just use the sample variance as my best estimate. Right? Now, we notate this a little bit differently. So these are still standard deviations of my sample mean. But when I use an S, that indicates that I wasn't using a population variance to calculate it. I was estimating it with a sample variance. Okay. So we're just going to use that sample variance because that's the best that we have when we don't know what the true population variance is, which is 90 plus percent of the cases. Okay. So now, um, you know, you can imagine All that's going to change in my confidence interval equation is before I had something like this, where this was the standard deviation of my sample means. Now I'm going to do the exact same thing, but use my sample variance. So I'll notate this. It's still the standard deviation of my sample means just using a sample variance instead of a population variance. Now, the other issue is when I'm converting, if I try to convert different values for the sample mean into z-scores, the problem is when I create a z-score, I'm gonna take, right, it's gonna look something like this. Well, before it was the standard deviation of my sample means using a population variance. Now, it's using a sample variance. The issue is to, to kind of sidestep a lengthier kind of uh, in-depth theory discussion. Remember, when we're calculating the sample variance, within that formula, we have an n minus one, right? We divide by n minus one when calculating sample variance. So depending on the sample size, what, what happens is that when I turn these into z-scores, the distribution doesn't actually end up being a standard normal distribution. And the real and, and kind of the reasoning behind it is going to have something to do with that, the fact that we're dividing by n minus one, right? So how, you know, we're using that sample variance as an estimate. How far off is our estimate going to be? What ends up being true is that it depends on my sample size, right? You can kind of imagine, you know, if I'm trying to get a best estimate for that population variance with my sample variance, well, because I'm dividing by n minus one, if my sample size is like two, Dividing by two is a lot different than dividing by one. But dividing by 1,000 isn't that much different from dividing by 999, right? So the size, my sample size will dictate how far off I am from that standard normal distribution. So it ends up being true, a little foreshadowing, is we can't use that Z value, or that standard normal Z, you know, standard normal distribution or Z table. We have to use this new distribution which we call student T distribution. And in fact, it's not just one distribution. There are several student T distributions. Okay. okay. So kind of just kind of setting this up here. So we don't just have one student T distribution. There are technically an infinite number of student T distributions. Bless you. Every single sample size would have its own student T distribution. So what's true about all of them is they're, they're really, really close to a standard normal distribution, but have a little bit higher variance. So the mean will still be zero for these student T distributions, but the variance is no longer one like the standard normal distribution. The variance is now going to be a little bit higher, right? So you can kind of think about why. Um, when I divide by n minus one instead of n, that kind of causes things to be larger. So I had a slightly higher variance. So 
uh, how spread out that is or, or how kind of much it varies from the standard normal distribution depends on something called the degrees of freedom. So I'll, usually you can write this as DOF, but these degrees of freedom, right? It's basically just N minus one. And that's kind of related to the fact that we're using that N minus one in that sample variance. Excuse me. So we've got our degrees of freedom now, and that allows us to identify which of these student T distributions that we're using. So what are some properties of the student T distributions? Well, it still has a mean of zero and it's still symmetric around that mean. So that's nice, right? So we still have this symmetric distribution that's centered around zero. It's just that it's a little bit more spread out. So we're gonna have a variance that's slightly higher than one, right? Now, as I get higher and higher sample sizes, that variance starts to get closer and closer to one and the student T distribution that I'm using starts to get closer and closer to a normal distribution. In fact, once we get to like a degrees of freedom of 100, so that would be what, a sample size of 101? Basically, we've got a standard normal distribution. Like there's, you'd have to go out to like the fourth or fifth or sixth decimal point to identify any differences. So usually, and I think uh, I'll mention this in the example we'll work through next week, but if I see a sample size over 100, Usually what you can do is just use the standard normal as an approximation because it's going to be so close, you're, you're, you're not even going to notice the difference, right? So, uh, but what do we do with these, you know, sample sizes less than 101? The degrees of freedom that aren't large enough to where we can kind of approximate it with a, with a standard normal. Well, um, you know, those are, the, those are the more interesting ones. So here's my standard normal distribution, right? If I were to draw it out. If I'm telling you that student T distributions have higher variances, what should be true about them relative to the standard normal? Yeah, as the variance goes up, we're gonna get kind of, you'd say wider, but it's gonna kind of smash down that, that distribution and make it like the tail's fatter, right? It's gonna get like, it is gonna look wider, right? So notice like, if I have a degrees of freedom of 20, it's gonna be kind of smashed down and look like I have a little bit wider of a distribution there. And if I go to do, you know, lower degrees of freedom, it just gets even more kind of flattened. So um, you know, we've already kind of talked about that principle before, but really what, what that stems from is that the variance of the student T distribution, it's gonna be the highest at low degrees of freedom. And then as we move up to higher and higher degrees of freedoms, right, we start to get closer and closer to that standard normal distribution and having that variance of one. Okay. So, this presents a problem to us. And actually, I'm gonna to try to draw this instead of using this because I don't like this slide. I, I did my best creating graphics on there, but I, I'm always better at drawing with my hands. So um, yeah, we'll use this. So let's say, I think about, here's my standard normal distribution. I get 1.96. I look up that area in the table and that area is, the right would be 0 0.025, right? So the shaded blue area is 0 0.025. That's if I'm using blue here will be kind of that standard normal distribution. If I have a um, student T distribution, and I'll really exaggerate this, but I look at something like that, right? It's flattened, right? So this might be a degrees of freedom of, I think in the slides maybe I said 20. So it's gonna be kind of flatter than my standard normal. Well, now notice if the blue area here was 0 0.025, the area under the curve above 1.96 for the student T distribution, right? That's gonna be an area that is much larger than 0 0.025. So I can't keep using those same kind of benchmark cutoff values that we've been seeing pop up for the student T. So the standard normal, when we know the population variance or we're dealing with proportions, man, we started to like recognize the values that we were seeing. With a student T, the value that we need to get 0 0.025 in the tail, well, I just said that green area is much larger than 0 0.025, so I'm gonna have to choose a T value that's gonna be maybe somewhere out here, right? Or greater than 1.96. And the T value that I need to get that desired alpha over two in the tail, well, that's gonna change for every single degrees of freedom, right? So, we don't, 
we don't recognize as many values when we're dealing with student t distributions because they, they change for every single distribution that we're looking at, every single different degrees of freedom. Um, and they're not going to be the same as that standard norm. Okay. So you can kind of imagine that's kind of what I was trying to get at here, but I, I think maybe that drawing it more extreme helps kind of, it is a better visual to, to see, you know, to understand this. So, you know, if we actually look up what those areas are for degrees of freedom of, of 20, the area to the right of 1.96 is 0 0.062. I mean, more than twice as large from the standard normal. And then if we go to these even lower degrees of freedom, the area just keeps getting larger, right? So what do we do? Well, we have a student T table that we'll use to look up what T values give us certain areas in the tail, okay? So I'm gonna stop, oh, I'm gonna get out here. And I will end up putting this on Canvas after class today, and we'll, we'll work with it a lot more next class. So I didn't think we would quite get there today, but. Oh, stop. Where did I hit? There we go. So let me zoom in here real quick. And actually, I'm thinking about it. I'm just gonna drag and drop this on there for everybody. So now the, the student T tables are up there, but I'll walk us through them. So how do we use these T tables, okay? So it's a little bit different than the standard normal uh, distribution where the area in the tail that you're thinking about is gonna be the area in the upper tail. So it's always gonna give you the positive values, right? But if this is symmetric, if I know that, say, the T value of 2 gave me, I don't know, 0 0.05 in this upper right tail, then I know a T value of negative 2 would give me 0 0.05 below it, right? This is a symmetric distribution. So the table only kind of shows you that upper, that right side, or that upper tail. So when we're building these confidence intervals, a lot of the times we know the areas we want in the tails, right? That was... Uh, Oh, wait, I say, did I lose that there? Okay. So where was that at? Yeah, right, we know the area that we want in the tails, but we have two tails, right? So alpha over two is gonna be the area that we know that we want in this tail. So even though this table has this kind of looks like it's labeled as alpha, in fact, if you wanna, if you wanna edit this or you wanna print this out and cross out, don't think of this as alpha, this alpha in the table, that's just telling you the area in that tail. Okay? Our alpha is com completely different. So we're gonna divide alpha by two. That's gonna be the area that we want in the tail. So this column headings, this is the area that you want in that upper right tail. The degrees of freedom then are on the left-hand side. So whatever your you know, sample size is, subtract one from it, and that's your degrees of freedom. So, if I was trying to find the T value that I would have alpha over two in each tail, and let's say alpha is 0.1. So 0.1 over two is 0 0.05. That's the area I want in the tail right here. Let's say my sample size is, let's use a 45. So my degrees of freedom would be 44. So what T value at a degrees of freedom of 44 would give me 0 0.05 in that upper right tail? I scroll down, stay in that 0 0.05 column, degrees of freedom, 44, a T value of 1.68. Okay. Now it's a little bit different. Notice, I think the standard normal distribution would be at like 1.64 there, or sorry, 1.64, uh, or between 1.64 and 1.65. So notice it's a little bit different. Okay. But that's how we use this table. Okay. We look up the area we want in the tail, go down to our degrees of freedom, and then that's the T value that gives you that area in the upper right tail. Okay. Yeah, so, okay. No, you're, you're, you're already anticipating a problem with this table. It's very useful when I'm trying to look up when I'm trying to find T value. So essentially this student T distribution is most useful for us when we're working in inverse or reverse, right? We know the area we want in the tail, then we can find the T value that gives us that. 
it's not going to be as friendly if we're working the other way. If I know the T value and I want to know, okay, what's the area to the left or to the right of it? Well, at any one degrees of freedom, I only have six values here, right? So that's going to be, yeah, no, you're right. So once we get to hypothesis testing, we actually have to use it for that. And it starts to become a problem. And we talk about what ultimately what we can do is really only put a range on things unless we can use Excel because really this table is built the same way as the standard normal. What was the standard normal distribution telling us? So really what the standard normal distribution was doing was it was taking some Z value. It was integrating that function from negative infinity to whatever cutoff value we, were, we had and giving me the area under the curve. Well, I can do that with a student T distribution probability density function. I didn't show it to you. It looks similar to the standard normal, just a little bit messier. I can do that as well. So when I'm using something like Excel, we can do that integration really quickly. It's not really, it doesn't have a stored table in it. It's actually doing the math for us. Yeah, but you're right. With a physical table, we're limited. Um, and that will present some issues. Not, not with confidence intervals, right? Because we're using kind of the same benchmark value. So that's why, you know, it's a little bit more practical to use this for confidence intervals. It's good. That's your, it's excellent though. Okay, so we kind of talked through this. Um, one thing I, I didn't point out on that table is I said that as we get higher degrees of freedom, once we get to like uh, 100, notice these values barely are, are hardly changing out to the third decimal. And if we actually could get to an infinite degrees of freedom, these would be the values that we see from our standard normal distribution. So one thing that's kind of handy with doing confidence intervals, instead of using my standard normal distribution where I'm like, okay, the area I want in the tail is 0 0.05. Scroll down here. Uh, well, I'm in between these two, so I'm gonna have to take the higher of the two. If I actually look at that last row, I wanted the area in the tail of 0 0.05, the z-score that would give that to me out to the third decimal would be 1.645, right? So I don't have to kind of, I'm not limited to two decimals here. I can actually get the standard normal distribution values out to the third decimal using this last row of the t-table. Because this last row is if I had an infinite degrees of freedom, right? Which isn't practical, but in theory, you know, notice once I'm past 100, these values for 500 degrees of freedom and for 1,000, they're pretty much the same as the standard normal. Okay, so here's our, oh, everything we have now for our confidence interval for sample means where we only have a sample variance. We now know a little bit more about how to use that student T distribution. We need to find our degrees of freedom now, not just alpha over two. Um, I think that I'll kind of stop there and we'll pick up on um, Tuesday, wait, we have our, day. is it a study day? That's what I thought. Okay. So we won't see each other till Thursday. Um, what I might do, well, no, I will, we'll see each other on, on Thursday. Um, we'll work through some examples where we use a student T distribution. We'll do some of them in Excel as well. And then that should be the last things that you, that you need for that assignment that I'll post today for that Excel assignment. So you can get up at least two thirds of it done um, because we've already done the proportion stuff in Excel and the sample mean stuff. So two thirds of the assignment we've already went through. And then that last kind of third of the Excel assignment will cover how to do that stuff on Thursday's class. Um, I won't, oh, I probably won't do uh, well, I'll post an online quiz, but I won't have it due Tuesday. I'll, I'll have it due Thursday. So you have a whole week to do it. I would suggest getting it out of the way so you don't forget about it. Um, but I'll get that posted as well as the next Excel assignment once I get back to my office. Uh, although I do have something that I, I wanted to bring. And I, now I don't, I think I have it in my, put it in my other courses slides because I wasn't sure where we'd be on time. But it's kind of relevant. Maybe people are interested. We got the NCAA tournament coming up. And something that we had talked about was that if the games are truly independent, um, that you know the outcome of any one game doesn't impact the next one, right? You still have the same quality of teams. That the probability of every game, like let's just assume that it was 
they're all equally as likely, right? So you could do, you know, what's the probability of getting a perfect bracket? You could do 0.5 to whatever the power of the number of games being played is. You know, you can kind of think about for the NCAA football playoff, there's how many different possible combinations, two to the third power, um, because you're just choosing the two kind of semifinals and then the championship. You could do the same thing here. You'd end up with 63 uh, different games that you're choosing. And so, you know, the odds get pretty astronomical pretty quickly. Um, there's a guy probably almost like six or seven years ago now who claims that, you know, well, that's if there's, you have no basketball knowledge, you're assuming it's a 50, 50% chance. That's not the case. But even if you factor in kind of the difference in percentages, um, so instead of 0.5 times 0.5 times 0.5, you do, you know, 0.9 times 0.6, or, you know, whatever the probability of, of the game of that one team winning is you still get uh, the odds of choosing a perfect bracket to be about one and what, 128, yeah, billion. So, you know, I guess uh, I'll leave you with good luck if you're, if you're doing some, some picks there of getting a perfect bracket. So uh, other than that, um, I think I said, we'll, we'll end there today and we'll pick up with the student distribution next Thursday, okay? All right, see you guys Thursday.